this is the Orlando Sentinels um, editorial board interview in conjunction with our sister paper, the South Florida Sun Sentinel, um, with Congresswoman Val Demings, who is challenging Republican um, Senator Marco Rubio. Um, we, due to a company-wide policy shift with um, and, and the company that owns the Orlando Sentinel and the Sun Sentinel. We won't be endorsing in this year's Senate race, but we thought it was very important to give you a chance to hear directly from the Congresswoman who's been representing Central Florida in many capacities for a long time and um, and 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 has has a really fascinating race behind her and, and a couple more exciting weeks to come. Um, so we are going to be spending about 30 minutes talking with her and i'm going to go ahead and jump in with our first question which is um we just talked about um the fact that um that that the debate earlier this week went very fast but yet there was a lot that was left uncovered what didn't you get a chance to talk about that you thought was important that for the interview? Well, thank you so much for that. And Orlando Sentinel, you know, we've been together a long time through the joys and pains of uh, protecting our community. And Sun Sentinel, it's great to have you to the table uh, as well. You know, I, I really, the time really went fast. It was well spent, I think, but I would have actually liked to have talked a little bit more about public safety. Um, and Marco Rubio's attendance record. Uh, you know, the foundation of any great community uh, is really public safety. And regardless of who people are, where they live, the color of their skin, or the economic base in certain neighborhoods, everybody deserves to live in safe communities. Um, the bottom line is everybody just deserves to be treated with dignity and respect uh, as well. So I certainly would have loved to have had more time to talk about why it's important to um, help to create uh, safe communities through hiring the brightest and the best law enforcement officers, making sure they have the best training and equipment, but also dealing with the quality of life issues in communities. Uh, when we give every community problem or every societal failure to the police and not deal with poverty and unemployment and low wages and substandard education, substandard housing, uh, we're just going to have a vicious cycle. So I wish we would have had more time. Uh, also, uh, great, Jay, I see you. Um, Marco Rubio does have one of the worst attendance records in the Senate. And I know some people tried to rescue him by saying, no, it was when he was running for president. No, look at his record before and after his run for president. He has one of the worst attendance records in terms of voting, but the worst in terms of uh, committee, missing committee hearings, where the majority of the work the legislation that we vote on, the majority of the work, those bills are crafted and written in committee. And so like 90%, he's missed 90% of hearings dealing with seniors, uh, missed dozens and dozens of hearings dealing with COVID and the Paycheck Protection Program that he loves to take credit for. So it would have been great to have more time, but I think we covered a lot of the issues that we needed to. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Well, and and actually, I I wanted to follow up on that. Um, you know, you you were Orlando's first female police chief. Um, that's how a lot of people got to know you, and um, and so I know that you have some strong views on the role that um, that the availability of high powered firearms have on the safety of a community. And, and we've seen mass shooting after mass shooting after mass shooting. What can be done at this point to make people feel as though they are safe going to a movie or going to church? You know, it was quite frustrating listening to the Senator talk about, well, the laws won't make a difference anyway. And well, why don't we just take murder off the books and rape and robbery and you know, forget aggressive drivers because we can't get them all. No, you do what you can to be proactive to address these issues. And certainly as a police chief, you know, my primary responsibility was the reduction of violent crime. My second priority as chief was to get crime guns out of the hands of dangerous people. Let's think about what happened in Uvalde. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about what the police 
didn't do on that day. But I want people who want to say, oh, well, it was all the police failure. And look, they had some issues and they need to investigate those. But how many of you think that, that the police would have hesitated at all had the shooter not had an assault style weapon that was created for the battlefield? They weren't afraid of the shooter. They were afraid of the weapon that he had that was designed to do damage, to take the enemy out quickly because of the damage that it does to uh, the body. And so, you know what? I understand a person's right to the Second Amendment and all that stuff, the right to bear arms. My father was a hunter. He had a lot of guns. He was a hunter. I served 27 years. But let's work to get these uh, dangerous weapons that were created for the battlefield out of the hands of dangerous people. Many like to say, well, it's, it's because of the music. Oh, it's because of video games. Where other industrialized countries play the same music and the same video games, and they don't have anywhere near the level of mass shootings that we have. Let's pass the legislation in the Senate, expand background checks, close the Charleston loophole, and, and, and raise the age to own an assault weapon from 18 to 21. Congresswoman, I thought I might ask you about uh, abortion. I know that was an issue that got a lot of attention and, and you and the moderator did an, I'd say an effective job at sort of uh, uh, framing that uh, Marco Rubio didn't want to uh, maybe say exactly what his beliefs were versus what he wanted to vote for. But on the other side, he did uh, ask you about uh, your stance as it comes to viability. Can you sort of define, I think you said that you were supported up until the vi uh, viability. Do you define viability as something that a doctor diagnoses or is there a numeric weak count voters could understand? Yeah, Scott, thank you for that. Look, if there's anybody out there who believes that Marco Rubio does not support a total ban, he said it over and over and over again. He supports a total ban with no exceptions. And now he's certainly trying to modify his answer because of it's become such a hot issue uh, in this race. When I say I support a woman's right to choose up to the point of viability, I basically support what's already there in Roe, Roe versus Wade. The Women's Health Protection Act, which is sitting in the Senate waiting for a vote, would codify Roe versus Wade into law. But Scott, when we look at viability, I've seen 18 weeks, 21 weeks, 24 weeks, 38 weeks, you know, 28 weeks, 30 weeks. And so I say that decision, that very precious private decision should be made between the woman and her doctor who, based on the examination, her medical history and all of those other things to the point of viability as determined by the medical professional. Okay, as by a doctor. That's okay. right, by a doctor. And then, but then there's that to save the life of the mother. Now, Michael, Marco Rubio basically said that's inconsequential, but we always to protect the life of the mother. But viability for me should be determined by a doctor. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll throw a question in here because it occurred to me a few minutes ago, uh, Governor DeSantis extended voting opportunities in Southwest Florida, which was hit directly by the hurricane. But there are areas in Central Florida that remain flooded and he did not expand any voting opportunities there. It coincidentally happens to be where you're from. Uh, do you know of or do you personally plan any legal action to try to get uh, people of Florida treated equally as the Supreme Court said in 2000 they should be in, in Bush v. Gore? Martin, I tell you what, I'm I'm certainly not a uh, perfect person, but I sure doggone it try to uh, represent uh, Central Florida as effectively uh, as I can, which means uh, meeting the needs of the people that I uh, represent. Look. I want a Florida where every person has a right to vote, has an opportunity to vote. You know, the governor said two years ago that Florida had one of the most efficient voting processes ever, that it should be a model to the, for the rest of the nation. Well, if that's true, then why do we limit the number of drop boxes? Why are we changing the voter ID laws and all of that in Florida if we had this great system? Look, I don't mind the governor extending 
vote, you know, voting days and making some provisions for Southwest Florida. I toured it. It was hit hard. But you're right, Martin. In Central Florida, I've toured those areas, too, where it's severe flooding. People are out of their homes. So why not uh, grant the wishes? And, and, and what I, I'm not sure if the supervisor of elections made a request, because when I've asked about that, I was told, well, the supervisors of elections made the request, and that's how uh, granting the extensions came about. So I'm certainly hoping I'm going to call um, my friend Bill Cowles and see if he made a request to have special provisions made for Central Florida to be able uh, to vote. Let the people vote. Let Republicans, Democrats, and independents vote. But we were hit hard, too, and we've got to make sure that we treat people fairly. But remember, People were arrested by the elections police and it just happened to be in Blue County. So we won't even get into that. But let's be fair and let the people vote. It is the cornerstone of our democracy and who we are as a nation. Make a note for me to call Bill Kyle. I'll throw in a question. Yeah. Here. I'm sorry. Thank yeah. you. That's okay. um, the Democrats have been hit kind of hard about um, not taking crime seriously enough. Uh, and that it's an issue, not just in the cities, but e everyone seems to be concerned about crime. What uh, what do you think more can be done uh, on a national level? Uh, you know, obviously it's pretty much a local level, but what can be done on a national level besides guns? No, I, I do think that uh, it, there is some role that the federal government can play. And I, I talk about this and we talk about criminal justice reform. We know that many police departments, a lot of them are larger, some are smaller. And I do think that we can come up with some national standards as it pertains to hiring, training, uh, equipment that will help some of the smaller police departments with smaller budgets. But Julie, we need to hire the brightest and the best, make sure they law enforcement officers, make sure they have the best training and equipment. But we have got to invest in the social ills that cause decay in communities in the first place. In Orange County, Florida, and I'm sure in some other counties too, we say the Orange County Jail is the biggest mental health treatment facility and the biggest drug treatment facility in the region. That's ridiculous. That is not acceptable. And I think former Chief David Brown, who is now the commissioner in Chicago, said it best. He said, every time there's a societal failure, we call the police to solve it. Not enough mental health counseling, give it to the police. Not enough drug addiction funding available, the treatment funding available, give it to the police. Schools failing us, call the police in. Substandard housing, let the police handle it. We've got to, yes, we've got to hold America to his promise as it pertains to policing. I, I did the job for 27 years. But we should hold America to its promise in investing in the social ills that cause decay in communities in the first place. If we know that every 26 seconds, for example, a child drops out of high school and we look at prisons around the United States, majority of people are black and brown. But guess what else, Julie? They dropped out of school. Could that be a clue that if we invested more in education on the front end, we could invest less in prisons on the back end? So. Hire the people who have the mind and the heart to do the job of policing, but invest in the social ills. Hold everybody counts, but everybody's accountable. Hold the police accountable. Hold the community accountable too. Bring the two together and let's build safer, stronger communities. Thank you. Well, um, I actually did want to follow up on the election security issues as well. Um, the Brennan Center. Common Cause, the ACLU, are all warning of uh, some serious, what they perceive as threats, um, largely aimed at uh, minority, poor, um, Democrat voters um, who, who may find their access to the polls challenged by surprise. Um, in the coming election, particularly on election day. What are you hearing and what do you think the, the federal government should be doing, if anything, or should they be leaving it to the states at this point? Oh, no, no, no. We tried that, Chris. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we, what are you doing for this election? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965 was about holding bad actors, as you well know, accountable who were doing everything from 
having poll tests that said count the number of jelly beans or guess the number of jelly beans and feathers on a duck and bubbles on a bar of soap and all kind of foolishness. And so we we've, we've got a you know John Lewis said the right to vote is precious is almost sacred. We've got to do everything and voter intimidation is real, right? We've got to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act that would help to restore the provisions that were taken away out of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that held bad states accountable. The Freedom to Vote Act, a lot of the same things. If we can get two more seats in the Senate, we break the filibuster and we're able to get those things passed. So we won't have to rely on states. We see what's happening in Florida. Now, I think that uh, you know, the removing the number or reducing the number of drop boxes, voter ID laws. If if a 98 year old woman has been voting with her birth certificate for 80 years and now suddenly she has to produce some other form of ID. I mean, the laws have to make sense. We know that there we need to have voting laws, but the laws have to make sense. If we had the, the most efficient voting system in Florida, why did we create the elections police? And look, at the Orlando Police Department, we issue what's, oh, I'm not there, they they issue what's called a notice to appear for people who are nonviolent, may have broken the law. Why make a physical arrest? I think one of the things that shocked me the most was number one, we were making physical arrests of people who were told they could vote. And then when they voted, they were, now you can't. But why not just issue a notice to appear? Why go out and make a physical arrest? It was all about sending a message to others. So we've got to make sure we inform voters, make sure you have your proper ID, you know where your polling locations are, educate, educate, educate. So we can kind of stand in the gap of voters who or, you know, being threatened to be intimidated, but create ways for them to have a clear path to the polls. We also have elections attorneys that are throughout the state, poll watchers, making sure that the process works for the voters. There's a lot of work. Thank you, Jay. There's a lot of work to be done there. Congresswoman, I wanted to ask you, you are uh, elected to the U.S. House out of a very blue district. You are running uh, in a state that is purple to be generous and uh, has been uh, tilting red uh, for the last couple of, of decades. What do you say to, um, and, and by the way, I wanted to mention, let you address one of the things I know Marco Rubio often says, you, you vote with Pelosi. I'm pretty sure he votes with Mitch McConnell, McConnell uh, most if not all the time as well. But in general, what do you say to residents who might say, hey, you're representing a really blue district. Now you, I'm not sure I'm comfortable if I'm a moderate with you representing me. You know, Scott, it took us a while to get to this really blue district, didn't it? When I ran in 2012, you know, I, I ran in a, in a red district. and But I ran because I believe that Central Florida deserved a better representative, someone who saw past people that only thought like him and in many instances, you know, a lot of other things like him. But, um, but you know, we went through redistricting in 2014, things changed and I ran in 2016 and won. But Scott, let me say this. When I first went to, let me back up, at the Orlando Police Department, I could not tell you the political party of the overwhelming majority of men and women. We had a mission, reduce violent crime, and we were laser focused on that mission. I took that same spirit and attitude to Congress. I've been disappointed, though, at the partisanship that there are people there who have no interest in writing laws or in, even enforcing the law. They only have interest in obstructing, being obstructionists, impeding, uh, stopping good government from moving forward. And so what I would say to the people, look, the best indicator of future performance is to look at past performance. I come as a law enforcement officer. I didn't make my decisions on political party. I made them based on the needs of the people. And that is the message that I have traveled around the state trying to convince the people, look, you've had 24 years total of Marco Rubio. How's that worked out for you? You know, we have property insurance that's crumbling, an affordable housing crisis, public safety. Yeah, he's the crime fighter when it's convenient, but he said the FBI was a Marxist dictatorship when and, and that um, the former president's keeping highly classified confidential documents in his basement was just a storage issue. And so I just happen to believe we can do better. And certainly I bring my law enforcement skills and ability to bring people together to get some things done, not just for the privileged few or those who can pay to play, but for all people. I didn't stay in law enforcement for 27 years, making my decisions based on political party. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Congresswoman, you've brought up affordable housing a couple of times, and I know that's a uh, that's an issue that's 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 very personal for a lot of us locally, as you know. But what um, what do you think can be done on a federal level, on a on a on a congressional level, to to uh, to start to address that? It, it, it's obviously a much bigger problem than can be addressed by one uh, by one thing. But where do we start? It is Jay. Oh. During this campaign, of course, I've been traveling quite a bit and all over the state from the Panhandle to the Keys, but spend quite a bit of time in South Florida. And then during one of those visits, I spent time with uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity. And I learned in South Florida that there's less affordable housing available in South Florida, in Miami, for example, than there is in New York City and Los Angeles. Now that's hard to believe, but that's very true. And so one of the things that I didn't get a chance to hit Marco Rubio on the other night was Marco Rubio has taken millions and millions of dollars from his buddies in real estate and in the private equity industry, has allowed them to come in, buy up properties, jack up costs and rents, and leaving us with a depleted pretty much inventory. And so we need to build more affordable housing. We need to work with the private sector. You know, one of the things that uh, Mayor Demings is doing is working with Universal to, yeah, we want to expand. Let's expand. Let's bring more businesses in. But a part of that commitment has to be, what is your investment going to be into building more affordable housing in this area? Because you're going to bring your workforce with you and they need to have some place that they can stay. We also need to look at tax incentives, uh, for homeowners, we need to look at ways to get people in, or you're going to put it on your own question too. At least you're fair. We need to look at more the tax incentives for people who uh, who want to buy a home, the greatest symbol of the American dream. I talk to many, many young people graduating college. And what do we say? Go to college, graduate college, buy a home. There's no way they can afford a home because they cannot pay the down payment because they're saddled with college debt. So I'm thankful for what uh, President Biden is trying to do, but we need to hold colleges and universities accountable for what they can charge in the first place. We know there are cases of fraud that have occurred with some of the, what, what they say, the most elite universities. And so it goes back to holding them accountable so people can afford to, as I said, experience the greatest symbol of the American dream, and that's home ownership. Thank you, Jay. Oh. I just heard my phone go off, and and um, and Mr. Slater was reminding me that that we are we are running short of time. So I want I wanted to ask you um, really quickly um, when you talk about um, you know money, um, Congress gave Florida a lot of money. And um, some of it was used to fly people from Texas to Martha's Vineyard. Um, and what, what do you think should be done and by Congress or anybody in response to that? Well, I think we have to go back to the drawing board, uh, just like we did with the CARES Act. There were some problems in the CARES Act. You know, no one planned the pandemic, but we our response to it was everything. We had to go back and try to clean it up through the American Rescue Plan, right? Obviously, when we give monies to states for certain purposes, we can't assume that there again, that we're going to have the good actors who are going to really help the people that need it the most. We, we should all be appalled that the governor took much needed dollars that could have been put to good use in our space to fly migrants from Texas to the middle of nowhere in Martha's Vineyard. You know, Chris, how we treat people matters. Um, how we hold people accountable matters. And we've seen this playbook before too in 1962 when black families were told that they were going to be flown to Boston so they could meet with the president and he was gonna help them with housing and jobs and find the American dream. And they were also taken to the middle of nowhere. And you know they got all dressed up and they were gonna meet the president and all excited. And they got there to the middle of nowhere and nobody was there to meet them, but locals 
just like we saw at Martha's Vineyard, who rolled through the occasion and really exemplified, I think, Americans' decency and our principles. So I know there's an investigation going on, um, initiated from the sheriff, a sheriff in Texas, and we do need to look at that. But there again, the federal government needs to look at how was he able to do that with funds that were sent for a specific purpose and a damn sure wasn't for that and make sure that we tighten up our laws and our processes so it can never uh, happen again. Well, um, thank you. We, we have come to the end of our time. Um, um, but I did want to thank you very much for, for taking the time to meet with us. Um, one more time, I do want to remind our readers that um, due to a change in our, our corporate policy, we will not be endorsing in this race, but we will be providing you some great coverage of this race. I think Chris may have a little glitch there. So yes, uh, and we of course encourage readers to uh, do their own research. Uh, Congresswoman woman, uh, Den Demings has a website. Uh, Senator Rubio has a website. I'm sure they'd be happy for you guys to check them out. Thank you, Congresswoman, for joining us. As uh, Good luck during the final uh, two weeks of the campaign, and we encourage everyone to get out there and vote today.